please make him welcome, Mr. Pearson Sound. Thank you. How are you feeling, David? Pretty good. Yeah? Well rested. Okay. So I think the best way to sort of dust off the cobwebs of last night and also to introduce your sound for people in the room that um, might not be familiar with your music is just to play a record. And um, I think we should get an idea of the kind of music that you make at the moment and play something pretty current. What's this? Uh, this is a track called Glut, which came out last year. So is that a very current release? Um, I guess it's about a year old now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's sort of s s one of the tunes that got popular last year. So I thought I'd play something because you never, not everyone, you can never assume what people have heard or what people know about what you make. So. Yeah, absolutely. And with that in mind, could you s maybe introduce yourself and let us know who you are, where you're from? Oh, yeah, my age, name. name, location. ASL. <laughs> Uh, my name's David Kennedy. I make music under quite a few names, uh, such as Pearson Sound, Ramadan Man, Maurice Donovan, several others. Um, I live in London. I'm from London. I uh, lived in Leeds for a bit. I co-run a record label called Hessel Audio, and I also DJ. Yeah. Yeah, and you're DJing quite a lot at the moment, right? I mean, it's fair to say that the last year has been a very successful f year for you as a DJ. Do you want to tell us about your schedule currently? Yeah, it's definitely got a lot busier, um, which is, you know, I've been DJing as long as I've been making music, so it's great. And I'm getting to travel all over the world to like, you know, like last month I was sort of in everywhere from Mexico to to Germany to, you know, Brussels to all, all, all across Europe and, you know, fortunate enough to be able to go to like Asia and America and other continents, which is really cool. So yeah, things things are really busy. So, I mean, I mean, DJing is the thing that obviously takes up most of your time because of the whole travelling aspect. So, yeah, I'm mainly busy with that right now. And are you enjoying yourself? Yeah, definitely. I think it's quite easy to get a bit run down sometimes. Like last month, I just hit it a bit. Well, I didn't. You know, I'm pretty straight edge, but I hit it a bit too hard in terms of taking on too many shows and sort of ended up being ill for three weeks. Like solidly, I just couldn't shake it. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm enjoying it until I just, you know, get get too busy for my own good. We heard in Scuba's lecture yesterday about the difficulty between running a record label, making tunes, and um, and DJing as well. I mean, how do you strike that balance? At the moment, it's quite difficult, really. Um, I think writing tunes is... I mean, the way I've always done it is I never really spend whole days in the studio. I am sort of take it in little chunks. So I've never really had a problem in that respect, but I think this year especially you know you, you might be DJing on a Friday and Saturday you get home on a Sunday you don't really feel like doing anything on a Monday Tuesday you might answer a few emails and then it's kind of Wednesday you might sp write some music and then it all starts again on Thursday so it it can be a bit of a squeeze for time and you know airports aren't the most inspiring of places but you've always got to be you know I'm always thankful that's what I'm doing and um, I think that's always important you can never get complacent with you know, whenever you see DJs moaning on Twitter about, oh, I've got to travel for like four hours to... It's just, yeah, you've got to realise how fortunate you are at the same time. Now, um, over the last week, we've been lucky enough to hear from people like Nile Rogers and Trevor Horn about, you know, selling uh, millions of records and um, the good old days of of people buying uh, buying physical products and so on. Is it fair to say that for your generation, you know, um, the reality is that putting out a record like Glut is really, you know, obviously... Creative, for f creatively fulfilling for you, but is basically a, a, a business card for your DJing services, and that's where your sort of touring income comes from. Is that the reality for a young producer DJ now? Well, I think, I mean, only being well, I'm 23, um, so I never really saw the days where producers would sell 20,000 singles or whatever, which you know, is a well, even that was not that much for the biggest tunes. So I never really saw the days where dance music sold ridiculous amounts of money so the way i've experienced it is i mean you do obviously you do make some money from releases especially if they do well um but yeah in reality in terms of income djing is more like lucrative because you know you, to make a tune it might take weeks and whereas to dj is one night and so yeah the, the industry has definitely changed in that respect and i think that definitely affects how you know you see producers who have made one big tune and then they're DJing all around the world, which is cool, but it's 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 almost unfair to have that pressure to 
to perform if you don't want to. I mean, you look at someone like Barry or he's never done any kind of live thing and he sort of stuck to it in that respect, even though he probably could have, you know, toured the world <laughs> 10 times over. So, yeah, I think at the moment there's this slightly weird thing where everyone's sort of expected to do a live show or expected to DJ, which which is a bit strange if it's not what you want to do. And, you know, when you're DJing around the world, how is that informing the music that you're making? And, you know, sort of further to that, as your venues get bigger, do you feel a pressure to make sort of big room records? Or, you know, is, is your DJing really informing the tunes that you're writing right now? I think, well, there's obviously a danger. I think we'll, we'll probably talk about it later on, but in terms of the dubstep scene, part of my theory of why things went, if you saw Scooper's lecture when we, he didn't go too far into that discussion, but as the music became more popular, obviously venues got bigger, crowds got bigger, crowds got more impatient. Uh, so I think the smoking ban in, in England, smoking in nightclubs was banned in about 2008, 2009, which obviously affects DJs feel like they have to keep people in the room to avoid them have going for a cigarette. So music gets harder, music gets faster, music gets you know a bit more in your face to try and keep people there. Um, but personally, I, I mean, obviously, if you're playing a festival to 10,000 people, you, you have to keep it in mind, you know. You, you, there's a lot less subtlety on such a big stage to such a big audience. And I just think it's not, it's about compromising not too much. Yeah, maybe chucking in. And you've got to realise with 10,000 people as well, there'll be 60% of people have no idea who you are, like no idea the music you play. So you can drop some of the bigger tunes, which maybe if you were playing to 100 people in London, you would never play. And it's not a bad thing. If it's still a good tune, it's a good tune, you know, regardless. So obviously the kind of venues you play does inform how you DJ and what you DJ. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. And as long as you're happy with what you're doing, you know. I think if you're if you're purposefully like, oh, I'll play this, I don't really like this tune, but I know it will get a good reaction. I think that's when it might be a problem, yeah. So what was the period of sort of musical innocence for you when you were sort of devoid of any of those pressures or influences or, you know, things around you? What was What was the time when you first started making music for the sake of making music? Well, um, I had piano lessons when I was young. Um, I sort of stopped doing it when I was about 12 or 13 because it sort of became, you know, uncool. Um, <laughs> and I always, I remember my piano teacher at school, she always got really frustrated with me because instead of reading the music, what I'd do is I'd kind of memorize how it sounded and then play it from memory rather than, you know, sight reading. So I always frustrated her, so she ended up trying to do jazz piano where you had a little, in each composition you'd have a few bars where you could do some little noodle and you could do whatever you want. So I enjoyed that more, but then eventually I stopped those lessons and at the time I had like an electronic keyboard, like a lot of kids and uh, just sort of made s recordings to tape and like made my own silly radio shows and stuff like that. And then eventually got to use computers and yeah, it just it's happened from there really, just started using Fruity Loops in 2000 and whatever it was, 2001, and kind of been using it ever since. So it was quite a, quite a sort of natural progression from like using little keyboards and tape recorders to eventually using some really budget demo version of this other software and having to, s because it was a demo, you couldn't save it. So after school, I'd just make, spend a couple of hours making a tune and then my you know, parents might get home and I'd have to sort of quickly bounce it out by sort of recording it live. You couldn't save anything, so it was very innocent in that respect. You just, it was a lot more creative, I guess. So what was the age that you first came into contact with music technology? Well, I think it was probably around when I was eight or nine using computers. I mean, I'm lucky enough to be young enough where I sort of grew up with the technology and sort of grew up with the internet. So I'm fortunate in that respect. So I've you know always been using them and at school it was always drummed into you. You know, you had IT lessons and stuff like that. So yeah, I've been using computers from an early age, which, is, you know, using a software for 10 years means you sort of know it really well and you sort of don't waste, you know, when I when I use something like Logic or a program I'm not unfamiliar with, I waste so much time you know, just trying to find out something really simple when if I've been using a software for that many years, it's very instinctive and it also, you know, it just becomes very, well, logical from uh, your point of view because you can just do what you want and you can express yourself a lot more quickly rather than having to worry about 
you know, how to even just draw in a note when in in Fruity Loops I can just do it like just just like that, yeah. What kind of music were you making at, at sort of early teens? Have you got anything with you? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> I was saying yesterday I had a bit of a funny story. I sort of, there was this sort of physics technician at my school who, um, I can't remember how, I, anyway, we found out that he was into electronic music. I think I like caught him making some jungle after school <laughs> once in like the science labs. And so I was got, we got chatting and he, I said, we, I made music too and I made him a CD. Um, complete with a massive page of notes about, you know, what the tune was based and influenced by. Anyway, like last month, I just got this email in my inbox from the same guy and he was like, oh, I just found the CD rummaging through my stuff and he ripped it for me. And yeah, it's quite funny, really. I mean, I had a few of the tunes, but there are a few of the tunes there which I'd lost on my computer. And yeah, it's quite a nice little insight into sort of the mind of a 14 year old just pressing buttons on a computer and it's it, it's quite nice because back then you know you weren't really making music for anyone I didn't send it to anyone it was just purely a very uh, you know I played it to a few friends or whatever but you wouldn't send it to DJs or whatever and it's quite refreshing in a way because now you know as soon as you make something it's sort of out there as soon as you play it on a radio show people are listening just because you now have an audience and I think I mean I don't, I don't regret that that's the fact because it's natural progression but it, it's I still really like the music I made at that age because it was just very, you know, a lot more innocent, I think. So clearly at 14, I mean, if you were going to clubs, you probably weren't supposed to be, but I imagine you weren't yet. Um, and you're making sort of a tear out drum and bass tune. Where, where's that influence coming from? Is it the radio I really, or what? I listen to a lot of pirate radio. I mean, in London, it was kind of everywhere. You know, you try and tune into Radio 1 and you'd uh, just you know, be, have all these other frequencies, just, you know, a couple of, I don't know what the correct term is, a couple of notches away from it on the spectrum and you'd, you'd hear all this different music. And there were definitely a couple I remember, like there's one called Rude FM, which was, well, it still exists today. It's like a drum bass jungle station. I could get that where I lived. And there was one called Itch FM, which was like this really cool hip hop station, which is really frustrating. The thing about pirate radio, because it's so transient, you know, um, a station could get shut down just did, while you were listening to it, it could get raided while you were listening to it. So I used to listen to HFM a lot, and then one day I tried to tune in and it just disappeared, and I don't think it ever came back. I'm sure you probably know more about the full story than me, but uh, that was kind of quite cool in a way. You'd lock into a station, maybe never even find the name. And I used to just make recordings of all this pirate radio stuff, which I still got. I should archive them or whatever. Um, but anyway, I wasn't going to clubs at 14 because I looked about eight or something like that. <laughs> So my first clubbing experience um, was going to a night called Forward in East London, which, I mean, Scuba talked about a bit yesterday, but I don't think you can ever really talk too much about Forward. Um, I mean, apart from I went to a couple of rubbish, like West End's rubbish clubs with some mates around that time as well. But yeah, Forward was my first clubbing experience, and I guess there's not really a better way to get introduced to music mm. in on sound systems. And Forward presumably had moved to Plastic People by the time you were going there. Yeah, it was Forward at Plastic People and it was on a Thursday night and because I was still at school, I think I was 17, um, I could only go in the holidays, so, yeah. So, you know, couldn't go out in the week. So, yeah, I went down in one half term on my own because that was sort of the dumb thing in the dubstep scene because no one else was into the music. <laughs> so, yeah, I went down on my own and just had such an amazing night and definitely used the cliche, it changed my life, so... Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, everyone in the room that's sort of a DJ or music lover has that moment or that period in their life mm. where they really fall in love with, you know, club culture or they have their moment in a club or music or whatever. Would you say that Forward was, was that for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you heard the tune I just played when I was 15. I mean, it doesn't actually have any bass in it. I think I didn't really know bass existed until I went to a proper club. I didn't realise there was this whole spectrum of frequencies that, I was just missing. I just didn't know it existed and I didn't know to put in my music. So I think that was the most immediate thing that happened when I first went to Forward. It completely changed the way I made music because I was like, right, this is what it can sound like. You know, you can have your nose rattled, you can have your sort of mm. ears shaking and your chest sort of... I mean, Forward at Plastic, Plastic People's a tiny club. They changed the layout a bit recently, but they also changed it a few years back. But there used to be little nooks and crannies which you could just go and sit in and they'd sort of amplify the bass and you just... It was a very intense physical experience. And 
you know, for sort of a 17 year old there, it was just completely crazy, really. And this was when you could smoke there as well. So this massive smoke filled room, you know, um, with this incredibly loud music and lots of lots of guys with like hoods up looking moody. Um, yeah, it was a very, a very formative time. I mean, a lot has spoken about that club and, and that club night, obviously, but for people that are here from outside the UK or, or can't really get an idea of the texture of what it sounded like, is, is there a record that you've got that sums up those sort of early forward days to give people a... Yeah, I think so. I mean, I I went to forward quite a lot. I mean, I wasn't a regular. It was every couple of weeks. Um, I mean, I'm, in, I'm in a bit of two minds. I think I might play this Casper tune because the first time I went to forward... Well, I met Ben UFO for the first time there, just standing outside. We'll probably get onto that in a bit. But I remember the first forward I was playing, I, w I went to, sorry. Um, Mala was playing from Digital Mystics. I think we had N-Type was playing and Genius. Um, but I remember N-Type, uh, so I was hanging out with Ben and he was a lot more immersed in the scene by that point. And he was telling me like, oh, there's this new producer called Casper. No one like knows who he is. Uh, this is a mysterious new producer. And like, N-Type had all these new Casper dubs. And I'm, pr I'm pretty sure this tune got played the first night I was there. Um, so I thought it might be appropriate to play it. Um, and for those who don't know, Casper's a producer from, from West London. I mean, a tune like that has just got this real intensity if you imagine it on a sound system you know six times this size and each of those bass stubs just really oppressing you i mean it was just an experience i've never really had and i mean i probably could have played any number of tunes to sum up forward but i don't know that one just stuck in my mind when i was having a look last night and um obviously apart from the physical element of the bass and the sound system there's also the personal element of the people that you'd meet there um, in terms yeah. of that fertile meeting ground of like-minded producers and, and fans, I guess, of, of the night. Yeah, I mean, as Scuba was saying, I mean, he was at the very first forward in 2001, but the way he saw it as people, you know, coming down, swapping CDs, this once a month club where people would come and hang out. And although I, the first one I went to was in 2006, there was still very much that same, same vibe. I mean, the scene had grown, but still forward was, you know, sometimes there'd only be 30 people there, sometimes there'd be 100 people, but it was never really that busy. And because it was every two weeks, people would make an effort to come down, you know. There'd be people who'd have had work the next morning at eight in the morning, but they still came down. And you'd see the similar faces every week. Um, and there was this really nice, yeah, personal sense of community. There was, there can only be have been about, you know, a couple of thousand people who are actually into the music in the whole world, pretty much. So it was definitely, you felt you were part of something, and if you like overheard someone talking about dubstep in the street, you know you'd, you'd go up to them and you'd, you'd probably know them somehow. You know, it's just this very, very strange community. And obviously, it grew very quickly, but for a good couple of years that I experienced it, there was definitely that vibe. You know, you'd see similar faces at nights. Everyone sort of had something to do with the scene. They'd either be a producer, a DJ, maybe have a radio show, like write a blog, um, so everyone everyone sort of did something. There weren't that many people who were just sort of punters. There was there was, there was, was a lot of people, well, mo most people had some involvement in the scene, and I think that's what made it pretty special. And yeah, I think the, f the personal element, I mean, the internet was around and did have important, very important things in developing the scene, but the way I remember it was a lot more about the people and yeah, this sort of group of people who are now off doing all sorts of different things, but we all sort of came from a very similar place. Um, clearly, you, you met um, Ben UFO and Pangea there, who who will go on to do Hessel Records, and we should certainly talk about that in a bit. But do you want to give us an idea of, um, uh, you know, some of the other producers like that are now sort of quote-unquote household names that you might have met down there then? Yeah, I mean... I mean, apart from Forward, there was this other night called the Red Star, which I got involved with. I played quite a lot. That was down in Camberwell in South London, which I don't know, not a lot of people have talked about. It's, there's not really anything written about it, but it was sort of this weekly weekly night, similar to Forward. It was kind of set up in a similar vibe to Forward. And that was that became almost, as, as the music got more popular and Forward got busier, a lot of people started going to that. Um, I think it was even on the same night as Forward, which is a bit controversial, but... Um, are there other people involved? I mean, there's <coughs> pretty much everyone who lived in London, to be honest. Everyone from like Bok Bok, who runs Night Slugs, to, you know, even Scream would just pop down just for fun with his mates. They'd all drive up from South London to come down. 
Um, I don't want to miss people out, but yeah, there's just loads of people who are now doing really cool stuff. You know, people from like Iconica to I can't th think off the top of my head. You know, a lot of people who I've released on my label, a lot of people like people like Untold. There was a lot of people who were involved in that who are now you know maybe really successful DJs. Or there was even people who used to see a lot and now kind of lost touch with, which is sort of shame in a way. But everyone's off doing different things. You know, some people are off traveling the world DJing. Some people are sort of lost interest in music and now doing something completely different. But it's just quite interesting to see where everyone's gone. Although we're all in that, in that in that same sort of situation and place at the time. So would you literally just go to the club and then go home and make a change straight after it was sort of that inspired? N not really. Um, I don't, apart from not really working at night, I I think it was more a gradual thing. You know, after going the first time, I realised I was missing all this bass in my tunes, so I started putting it in, and then I'd send my tunes to people, and they'd they'd be a bit more popular. And I kind of realised what I was I was missing. And then when I started DJing myself and playing on sound systems, that's like almost sort of self incubation. You can you can finish a tune that day and play it that night. And as as you play on more and more sound systems, you realise what sounds good, which frequencies work, and yeah, you can just test stuff out. You can play a tune and, oh, that wasn't quite weighty enough and add more bass or, you know, that was overpowering and take some out. And kind of, kind of DJing almost becomes like having a massive pair of monitors in <laughs> which you can just use and test out stuff. And that was definitely the vibe at Forward and Red Star. Yeah, I played Red Star quite often and I just always have a new bunch of tunes and just go and test them out. And it was very useful. I just hope that there's people who can have similar experiences today because... I feel very fortunate to be able to have that sort of creative ground to experiment in. And as a fan of the music, certainly another environment where you'd go and be excited to hear new dubs was a club called DMZ. Um, do you want to talk about your experiences there? Yeah, I mean, DMZ was, um, well, it's still going. And DMZ is, is a club night often in Brixton, which uh, has changed venues a couple of times. But... It's it was every two months, so it was a bit more of a sort of special occasion, and it was on Saturday night rather than a Thursday, so it was it was a bit more of a party. It was a bit more of a rave, and it was run by the DMZ guys, um, Mala, Koki, Loafer, Sergeant Pokes, and the whole point of the night was it was their night, and they'd headline every night and play for two hours at the sort of peak time, and that was the time where you'd hear all the new Koki dubs, you'd hear all the new Mala dubs. And everyone would make an effort to come down. People would cancel bookings to come to DMZ. People would, you know, I remember I got asked, do you want to play in whatever city that night? I was like, oh, I can't, it's DMZ. You sort of make, which sounds crazy now. You, people would actually do that. People would make the effort to come. And it's a lot bigger capacity as well, you know, for, I don't know, 600, 700 people. So, yeah, and everyone would be there. Basically, everyone in the scene would come down to those nights. Um, so, yeah, it was a bit more of a party, maybe. Forward yeah. was a bit more eyes down, like quiet midweek session, have a few beers, whereas DMZ was sort of till 6 a.m., you know, proper proper full-on well, rave, I guess, yeah. In some of these sort of original... D I just found this out the other day when I was going through my records and someone told me, but some of those original DMZ 12 inches are worth a lot of money now because they're sort of vinyl only. Have you got anything with you that would be yeah, a classic I feel the DMZ Yeah, the most appropriate thing to play to represent DMZ would be a DMZ record because I mean al although they they always invited guests you know there were loads of people on the lineup um, but it was kind of always about DMZ you know everyone would, the room would massively fill up when uh, fill up when DMZ came on um, so I think I'll play a record by Mala who's definitely a massive influence you know he was playing he was playing at forward the first time I went down and playing all his new dubs I think I'll play a record called anti-war dub which is uh Quite a big tune by Mala, and I think yeah, it's pretty hard to get hard to get now. On vi it was a vinyl only release. I bought two. <laughs> I think it was the DMZ third. I said every year they'd have a birthday party and it would kind of be a slightly bigger and slightly bashier lineup. And I remember it had been a couple of years since this record had been out and the Digital Mystic stepped up and there was this sort of really tangible excitement in the air. And like Mala opened. I mean, DMZ birthdays, people would travel from America, people would travel from all over Europe for a club night, which is 
Yeah, <laughs> you could always buy a T-shirt with the lineup on. And but yeah, people would travel thousands of miles to come to it. And uh, all these international producers who you'd never met and just talked to on the internet, they'd come down, you know, and everyone would get to meet each other. But anyway, DMZ was stepping up and there was this sort of amazing excitement in the air and Mala just put this record on and the place just, I think there's a video of it on YouTube somewhere, the place just completely went off and yeah, it's one of my favourite memories. But I think this tune has a lot to say about the DMZ vibe. Um, I mean, it's called anti-war dub, such a sort of positive, spiritual, uh, a, a genuine spiritual message. It's not just some a cappella chucked over the top. It's very much sums up their sort of ethos and the way Mallet approaches music. And he, he's very much about about keeping things keeping these keeping things real, as in sort of a real physical product, having a real club night where people come to and sort of joining people together. And I know that probably all sounds a bit wishy-washy, cliche, but with Mallor, it's 100% genuine. And yeah, if you ever get the chance to see him DJ or, you know, give a, give a talk or whatever, definitely do it. We were lucky enough to have a lecture with Mallor a couple of years back on the Academy, which you should definitely check out online if you haven't seen it, because he's, you know, definitely a huge influence on many of us. You know, including yourself, who is now often to be found on the same lineup. You know, with Mala. So, uh, you know, yeah. going from the the boy that's sort of the passionate um, DMZ fan that's taking the night bus to Brixton, you know, and and cancelling any arrangement in order to be there. Fast forwarding to being 23 and being billed on the same lineups. You know, how does that yeah. feel coming full circle? It's crazy, really, because you know I've, I had my did a fabric CD and had launch party and had him down to play, and it was just. That circularity to it is incredible, and you know, I'm just always very thankful to him and his approach to music, which definitely informed mine. And what was I going to say? I've lost my train of thought. Well, I think you know certainly uh, another influence that, um, if I can say, your generation has taken from you know the DMZ and, and Mellor approach to music and elsewhere as well is is your commitment to sort of vinyl and and cutting dubs and and all of that i mean maybe we should talk a little bit about that because you know we we heard you play the other night on on sunday night and clearly you're playing from serato yeah. but um you have a also as a label you have a real commitment to putting out records as well so do you want to explain that sort of that balance yeah there's definitely sort of a conflict and a sort of inner inner conflict with this we were talking about it earlier um or yesterday and you know the fact that I love vinyl as a format, but then again, not DJing it with myself. It's always been something that's sort of had me a bit torn. Um, I mean, I run a vinyl only club night, even. Um, so it's all. Very What's your vinyl only club night? It's called Acetate. It's uh, well, it's in Leeds currently. I don't know. I might do some elsewhere, but it's it's kind of a sort of just play area for people just to bring a load of vinyl and just play it without any technical problems because but a lot of the reason that people have stopped using vinyl is clubs not looking after their turntables you know leads being dodgy needles being rubbish or pitch controllers being very inaccurate and it's a bit of a vicious circle because if the clubs aren't looking after their decks then no one's going to use them and if no one uses them then the club's like well why should we spend a thousand pounds on a new pair of decks when no one's using them. So it's a vicious circle and that's exactly what's happened in the last few years is basically no one using vinyl in club situations now and only a few clubs where you know everything's going to be cool and you know if they care about their technical setup is is um, the sort of only places you can play vinyl. And to go back to Mallor again, you know, he's as a 100% vinyl DJ. Oh, he, he obviously has a lot of frustrating experiences where he, he gets booked, travels thousands of miles, puts on his first record, then he just gets like a big feedback drone. And it's just like, if you're going to book Malay, at least make the effort to make sure everything's tidy. So yeah, I'm a big proponent of vinyl. I love how it sounds. I love the physicality of it. As You know, Serato's great and sort of digital DJing is great. I mean, tra traveling so much. And you know, sometimes you might play three shows in a row and not have a chance to go home. And there might be three completely different gigs, like warming up for a band and then doing a headline slot and then maybe you know closing a night. And they're going to be three different sets. I don't know how they did it back in the day, but for sorry, I'm looking at you when I said that. <laughs> you know, I don't know how they did it um, back then, but. Uh, you know, for me now, it's two just, crates, mate. Two crates. Well, yeah, exactly. Or have some record record boy who has them on his back yeah, and on your shoulder. <laughs> but that, personally, that's a format for me, and I'm quite, I'm picky about the stuff I play. You know, if it's not well enough produced, I'll give it a little 
you know, master at home, change the EQing. A lot of the time, digital formats can be a bit too harsh, I find. So, you know, when EQing them in the club, I like to sort of make sure they're not ripping people's ears off. Um, but in terms of vinyl, I just love it because when, I, when I'm playing with vinyl and I've got a big creative vinyl, it's not so much about the artist and track name, which is why I don't like Serato and having this big screen in front of you and desperately trying to find the tune you're after. With vinyl, it's very much more visual. And a lot of my house records, for example, I've got no idea who made them, but it's, it's like, oh, I want to play the one with the yellow label with the dog on it. And you know exactly what that record is. And it's a lot more instinctive and more fun. So when I'm playing with Serato, a lot of the time, I'll just switch off the screen off my laptop, have it completely to one side, and just sort of, I see my laptop as like a sort of digital record box. I see the hard drive as just a massive crate of vinyl rather than having it right in front of my face and just, you know, the cliche of looking like I'm checking my emails. When you, obviously when you're going to forward at the beginning or your first clubbing experiences, you know, the majority of people would be playing acetates, they'd be playing dubs. Yeah. Um, you know, was it exciting when you finally got to cut one of your records? Yeah, well, it, it was the done thing, really. Like, CDJs existed back then, but no one really used them. Um, they were very expensive, and it was around 2006, 2007, I think, that they really caught on. Um, but, yeah, everyone cut dubs, pretty much. Um, it was the rit ritual of, you know, for nights like DMZ and Forward, you cut fresh dubs. I remember... <laughs> so I, It sounds like I love Mala, but <laughs> I remember Mala once, his bag got lost at the airport, and he specifically called up the cutting house, got them to open up on a Saturday, and he cut like a whole fresh batch of dubs for for the night. And it was very much a sort of ritual almost going to the cutting house. And I mean, I don't want to sound like I just played 100% vinyl all the time, but I did cut, you know, quite a bit. And it was great because your tunes would get a bit of mastering before they were cut as well. You know, if you play something off CD and hasn't been through someone else's ears and someone else's equipment, whereas if you cut it to dub play, it's been through a mastering engineer's system and they've tweaked it a bit. Um, which obviously makes it sound better. And yeah, that, that was the format, and it's, it's a very sort of nostalgic format. I mean, I might play something off dub plate because it's kind of got, it's cut in a different way to vinyl. It's cut a lot more raw and it's a lot more loud and uh, sort of crackles a lot more. Um, I'm trying to think what I can play. I can play something new actually, because I, I still cut plates occasionally. Um, I might play a VIP of a tune I made. But the thing about dub plates, they cost like, you know, well, you can get 10 inch ones, which are a bit cheaper, but like 12 inch ones cost you know, 50 pounds or 60 euros or whatever. Um, so it's not cheap, and you're not just going to cut something that you spent three hours on. Um, so it, it makes you think about what you're playing a bit more and makes you commit to sort of finishing, finishing tunes and commit to sort of your ideas and have confidence in your music and other people's music if you're spending that amount of money on it, I think. So yeah, I'll play something. And I've, I've got a couple of dubs, we can have a little show and tell, so they smell really nice. <laughs> so yeah, this is a little VIP I did of a tune of mine called Grab Somebody, which I don't think is coming out, but... So yeah, if you, if you feel a dub plate as well, it's kind of... It's like it's like made of metal, basically. It's sort of a metal plate covered with wax. So not only do they weigh more, um, they wear out as well. So if you've had a dub that you've played 50 times, it starts to get real crackly and sound a bit sound a bit weird. Um, but there's loads of dub plates from back in the forward and DMZ days that I've never come out, never been released. And sometimes the only copy of the tune that exists is on one of these, and it's a very transient medium. So there are certain tunes that will just actually just be lost forever, which is it's kind of quite romantic in a way, um, sort of how these very famous original dubstep tunes are just eventually just going to disappear and just wear away into the into thin air. So, talking of vinyl, um, you know your record label Hessel has a commitment. In fact, sometimes you put out records that are vinyl only, don't you? Um, yeah, not not with Hessel. Quite a few of my own productions are vinyl only. Um, to be honest, mainly it's due to using very dodgy samples rather than trying to uh, impose stuff on people. You know, in fact, the only the only vinyl only releases I've done have been ones with incredibly obvious and illegal <laughs> sampling in it. So um, that's the reason really behind it. It's not an elitism thing. It's not like oh, I can play it off my laptop, but you can't. It's more just I don't really want to get fined by whatever major label. So. <laughs> Was the Swamp 81 
um, vinyl only. Yeah, um, yeah. Re the release I did on Swamp 81 called Work Them and Full Short, that was vinyl only, but that was the choice of the label, that's the way they run things. Um, I think they've got plans for digital eventually, but I know they have quite an old school ethos like that, which you know I respect and it's frustrating for some people. <laughs> but you know, it's the label's choice at the end of the day. If they're putting out the music, they can choose how it's sold, how it's presented, mm -hmm. which I think is always important if that's a label's ethos and sort of the way they want to do things, then you just got to respect that, I think. And if you, I know there's people who've even bought turntables just to get a vinyl only release, which might seem a bit excessive in these sort of economic times, but yeah, I think it's kind of up to the label how they, how they run things. But with Hessel, we always do digital and it comes out at the same time as the vinyl. So it's a bit more, you know, we like to keep it that way because we DJ digitally. So it, it only seems fair to me that we sell it digitally as well. And just while we're on the subject of um, work them on Swamp 81, is it fair to say that that's sort of, you know, around the time where things really snowballed for you in terms of taking off? That was a, it was a very big year for you last year, wasn't it? Yeah, I think well, 2010 was a bit funny because I kind of, I wrote loads and loads of music, I had it all stacked up. I was still finishing uni at the time, so I had quite a lot of free time to make, make stuff and end up writing loads and loads of music. and. The way it came out, it turns out I had like sort of a release every single month, which kind of <laughs> broke and battened, battened people down until they sort of listened to some of my stuff. And it was just sort of a bit over the top and like release after release. But yeah, I worked with them and, you know, Glatt and a couple of remixes I did definitely, yeah, definitely helped. And the fact that I worked with them was on vinyl only as well, I think also helped because it didn't become too overplayed and it sort of still stayed a bit fresh, I think. I don't know, that was my theory on it. It kind of, some people think it hasn't even come out yet still, because you know, it's not on iTunes or whatever, which, which shows that maybe keeping things vinyl only sometimes avoids oversaturation or over, you know, being in people's faces too much. And a lot of people compared work them, you know, with the, the influence of sort of Chicago and stuff. I mean, were you listening to a lot of that music at the time or? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of impossible not to really because Duke and Footwork was so hyped and so like the next. Cause, uh, I mean, London has a habit of picking up on other <coughs> other people's genres and then copying them and then rinsing them to the ground, unfortunately. Um, I think like to a certain extent that happened with with Duke. It was kind of the, the fresh new sound and everyone really got on it. But for me, tracks like Work, Them and Glut, they were a lot more influenced by Baltimore, which hasn't really been... Uh, I mean, I kind of missed the whole Diplo, Mad Decent thing because I wasn't really into that sound at that time. But the whole Baltimore thing in the UK, I don't know, I d I didn't seem to take off as much. But that was always what influenced records like Work Them and Glut a lot more than Duke, I think. I mean, it was, I think it was just so happened that the two occurred at the same time that they got compared and the fact that there were sort of chopped vocals and a couple of sort of like dibby 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 bits which come from, come from Duke. Um, that it got compared to that, but for me, you know, the use of the breaks and the way the rhythms flow, it's a lot more like sort of Baltimore club music for me. Can we can we hear a little bit of work then, just to give people an idea? Of yeah, it? sure. Because um, <coughs> yeah, sorry if you find that tune annoying. If you've heard it too many times, that kind of vocal gets in your head a bit. So let's talk about your record label. You, you mentioned about some of the people that you met in your early days going clubbing and seeing as you're only 23 now, that must have been very young. Um, back, in, back in the day. <laughs> sort of, yeah. <laughs> back in your day. Um, yeah. Uh, ben, ben UFO and, um, and, and Kevin Pangea. Tell us about your relationship with them. Yeah, well, basically I went down forward first time on my own. You know, none of my friends were into this kind of music, so... And Forward always opened really late because, you know, they was a bit sloppy with opening hours. And so we waited for like an hour normally before getting in. And I know this guy was outside and I met him. I think I might have spoken to him on the internet a couple of times. There was a big website where people into dubstep chatted. Um, but yeah, we just got talking and it's just quite bizarre to think that, you know, if the club had opened on time or I had decided not to go down that night, I wouldn't know Ben, who also lived with Kevin Pangea. And we wouldn't have started the label and things would be really different now. So, yeah, it's, it's very bizarre. I don't like to think about it too much, get into fate and destiny and all that. It's it's just very strange that he was the guy I met um, the first time I went down. And, you know, we're still really good friends and DJ together and run the label together. 
So presumably on Hessel number one, you had no idea how to put a record out and you had to yeah. experiment, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, it sounds to be, yeah, let's start a record label. It sounds easy, but I'd, I had no really idea how to do it. And I had a help from a couple of friends, this guy called Whistler, who ran, who runs a radio station called, well, a radio, internet radio station. Um, so I called him up, I was like, so he started his own label, I was like, so how do you do it? And he gave me a really detailed breakdown. And basically the thing he said was like, you need distribution. And I kind of didn't really understand that at first. I was like, what, you just press your records and you sell them to people, right? But it, I didn't realize how important it was to have someone to get those records to people, because there's only so much you can drive around London in a car and you know, sell them to shops. If you if you really want your record to be heard by people, it's just got to go all around the world and it's got to go all around the country and in different shops. So. I wrote this letter to our distributor, um, put in a few c CD, a CD with some tunes, and then eventually heard back from them, and then had like some hour-long heart-to-heart on the phone, found out how it all worked, and yeah, it's kind of just started like that. It's very much a, a learning process, you know. We had a, our second release had sort of five different test presses, it took like six months to come out, full of nightmares. But experiences like that just help really, because if you have it too easy, if you you know, if everyone did everything for us, I don't think we'd have a clue what's going on. I think I'm very grateful that we had those sort of painful <laughs> initial experiences. And eventually we signed to a, a pressing and distribution deal, which is basically you just give the distributor music and they arrange all the pressing. I mean, you still do the artwork, you still have full creative control, but they sort out the boring stuff. You know, they they get the artwork in the right formats and they, you know, arrange delivery and yeah, the, the, it makes life a lot easier and simpler, and they get better rates with studios and shops. So, yeah, if if you can, getting a press and distribution deal is great. But it, I think it's also good to try doing it the DIY way first. I mean, I used to go around Soho in London to the record shops, and I'd sell re shop, I'd sell shops to, rec I'd sell records to shops. Um, you know, my, myself, I'd even sell records outside DMZ. You know, five pounds a record, and I even I remember. Specifically, Benga, he bought one of my records. He was, see, he used to sell his CDs. So he's like, oh, I remember I used to do that. And, you know, he'd, he'd buy a record off me. And it was very nice. I think people appreciated seeing it's kind of like a farmer's market, you know, meeting the person who made your potatoes. It's like me and the guy who <laughs> made your record. And I think people kind of like that in a way. So, yeah, I did that for a bit and then realized it's not really about standing outside a nightclub at five in the morning trying to sell. And half the people lost the records on a night bus as well. So it's a bit, it's a bit silly. But it was a good experience. And so fast forward to now and you're doing, um, you've, you've just released a compilation, which in a way is a summary of everyone that's on the label, right? I mean, it's called 116 and, well, 116 and Rising. Yeah, I don't have a copy, but um, yeah, we it was our first biggest project because we've been running since early 2007 and it's, so now, it's now been four years. And we kind of thought we'd just have a crack at doing something bigger. So we haven't done an artist album. We don't really have any plans to, um, but we thought, so there were quite a lot of compilations that were coming out last year by big record labels, you know, sort of more commercial stuff. And I think our distributor was like, look, you guys should try doing it. I mean, you can do it. They they, they definitely believe in us and they've been very supportive. So they, they gave us all the support we needed, told us how to do it. And we assembled all the tunes and got together some nice artwork, had a few hiccups along the way, but eventually got it out. And we've got this product that we're really happy with. You know, it's like a triple vinyl, really nicely designed, double CD, really good artwork. And the whole vibe of it was having everyone who's ever released on the label. So it's, it was a very sort of sort of democratic affair. You know, there was no preferential treatment for any particular tune. You know, on, e on the vinyl, there's two tracks on each side. You know, there's no tune that gets the whole side. It's We just wanted to, it's kind of a thank you, you know, everyone who's released on the label and sort of pushing what they're doing now. You know, like Cosmin TRG was our first release in 2007. And you know now he's changed his name slightly and making very different music. But you know, it's still great stuff. And so we wanted to put, put it out and just sort of show what people are up to. And as well, we, you know, we've done a tour to support it and stuff like that. So it gives you a lot of different opportunities. And also having a CD out there appeals to a lot more people. You know, there's a lot of people who don't buy vinyl, no interest in vinyl, but as soon as there's a CD on the shelf, you know, that's the people who go to HMV or, you know, people who just want a CD for their car. Y you can never be too complacent with who your music's reaching, I think, because you might assume everyone's heard all your music, but there's a lot of people who never will have. So we put in a second CD of like some selected back catalogue just to kind of maybe give people a, 
a, a bigger perspective on what we've been doing for the last few years. And if there is a sort of Hessel camp of artists, like a, a Hessel crew, um, do you want to list some of the people that have released on the label? Yeah, well, aside from my own stuff and um, Pangea's music, um, there's about eight or nine of us now. And we're all mates, you know, we're, there's no one on the label that I've never met and there's no one on the label that I wouldn't go for a beer with. So it's a really nice sort of environment to work in. We've got Untold, um, we've got, well, James Blake, we released one of his first records. We've got uh, El Gato, uh, Joe, Blauan, I don't want to miss anyone, it's like naming my children, Paveralist. Uh, I think that might be it. Yeah, so there's, there's a really nice crew of people and you know everyone's mates and everyone gets along and yeah, it's just a really nice thing to have. I don't think I'd ever want to release someone's music if I hadn't met them or you know, didn't get along with them. If you thought someone was an idiot, I'm not sure I'd, I'm not sure I'd want to put out their music, to be honest. And so going back to release one, I mean, what, what's your, what was your ethos? What was your manifesto when you got together and decided you wanted to do Hessel and where did the name Hessel come from? Well, at the time we were in Leeds, I was at university in Leeds for a few years and Ben and Kevin were also in Leeds and they lived together. And they'd been in Leeds for a couple of years and I came up sort of as a fresh-faced first year student and I kind of wanted to start a label. Those guys were my sort of dubstep friends. So, yeah, I was like, I want to start a label. They were into the idea too, so we sort of thought of a name. We We were getting sent tunes at the time because we were you know, DJing in clubs a bit, and we had a radio show. And there was this guy called TRG from Romania who sent us a couple of really amazing tunes, um, which sounded very different from what was being made at the time. Like, if you if you think of what defines dubstep as a genre, a lot of people would be the sort of the half-time beat pattern, the sort of very, like, kick, snare, sort of slightly more sort of sluggish, half-step kind of rhythm. But the tunes that this Romanian guy sent us were completely different. They were like garagey, shuffly. They had a completely different groove from anything that was being made at the time. Um, so we thought that was an ideal way to start the label. And yeah, initial problems aside, we got the first record out and it was really well received. Had quite a few DJs playing it. And I think people found it quite refreshing in a way. And yeah, that's kind of how it started. Then the name comes from the street that Ben and Kev used to live on. You know, we thought of. We had a big brainstorm trying to think of a name, and it took ages. Had some, you know, rubbish, rubbish um, <laughs> potential ones, and yeah, we actually changed the name at the mastering session for the first release. Like he was like, "So what should I write into the groove?" And we're like, "We, we it was going to be Hessel Avenue, but we changed it to Hessel Audio." And it's funny how these things <laughs> work out, isn't it? Um, so yeah, we had the first record out, then had a few months because of all the problems with the second one. Got that out, then it became a bit more. A bit more flowing, and then when you get more of a reputation, then maybe you get sent a bit more interesting music. And mm. yeah, a lot of the releases we've done have been very sort of natural processes. Like someone like Joe, for example, he we've known him for a while, and he kept on sending us music and hang out with him for ages. And it was never like unsolicited in a way. It wasn't like, dear Hessel Audio or mm. dear label, please find attached. You know, this tune. it was very much he he. We knew he was working on stuff, and it was very back and forth and then eventually sent the right tunes and yeah, we we rolled with it. And I mean, uh, the 116 and Rising is a really good starting point to understand if you want to get familiar with the music of Hessel. But, you know, bearing in mind that you've gone from like a first DIY release to now a, a well distributed and beautifully produced sort of comp, uh, there's some people I know, participants that already have labels here um, and, and it's just as valid for them as for people that are thinking about starting a label. If there's a couple of bits of advice that you had just from yeah definitely I mean the experience that you could impart in 2011 with yeah. the label what what would they be I would have loved to have someone do the same to me um, but yeah it didn't happen so I'm, I'm more than willing to share a couple of things I mean firstly I would say just make sure the music you put out is amazing basically because there's a lot of labels I think who release kind of all right tunes and it just doesn't quite generate that same excitement if you're sort of consistent with the music you release, if you're consistent with it being original, um, not gimmicky, you know, sort of forward thinking and the kind of, the, th the way we see it with Hessel sometimes is the kind of stuff you'd listen to in 10 years time, you know, if it's got that longevity, if it's not something people are going to get sick of, then, you know, it's something we'll probably be interested in. So that's one thing, I'd say be original and obviously name helps and the way you present yourself, you know, if you call yourself like 
slime audio or like sort of filthy bangers <laughs> or something like that. You know, your label's gonna be perceived in a very different way to if it's called like, you know, Sandwell District, which sort of reflects the kind of music that's on it. So maybe that's something to think about. Um, I would say try and keep the boring admin -y side in check because I mean, we had it a bit, we didn't do the much of it, and then four releases in, sort of suddenly had this big backlog. You know, as soon as you start selling records, it all catches up with you. So I would say keep people like the Mechanical Copyright Protection Societies in in good, in you know, in good check. Make sure you're paying everyone, you know, account to your artists, tell them, you know, be open with them. There's nothing worse than labels that are all shady and, you know, try and ask for royalty statements and they just, you know, ignore you. I think it creates a slightly uneasy atmosphere because you know, they're making money off you, so why shouldn't you get your cut? So I think, yeah, be open with your artists, keep your business end in, in good order. And yeah, just also, I don't really like it when labels announce a massive list of like, we're gonna release these 12 releases in this year, and then you get the end of the year and they've like released one, if not two. I think there's a lot to be said, and we do it with Hessel, just, just sticking your cards close to your chest a bit. Don't get people's hopes up because there's inevitably delays, especially if you're doing vinyl. There's inevitably things that can go wrong. You know, like even the last couple of weeks we had a sort of lacquer from the pressing plant that got missing, ended up in some depot in Holland. Like they couldn't find it for ages, and that holds up the release by two weeks. Yeah, there's always these problems that happen. So if you tell people it's out next week and then it doesn't come out for two months, then people get a bit like, oh great, I don't, don't really care now. So if, if you're like, it's coming out, it's coming out on this date, and it does, then I think it creates a better, a better vibe. That's how we do things anyway. Cool. Thank you very much. And um, so we talked technically about the um, label side of things. Let's talk techie about your, you as a producer for a minute and yep. geek out um, <laughs> on some technical things. What, what did you start off using and, and what do you use now? to make your music, I mean? Well, I started off using all well, these keyboards and tape recorders, and then I started using a demo version of this software, which, you know, I had to bounce out of stuff like that. And then I started using Fruity Loops. And to be honest, my setups kind of stayed pretty consistent. Um, I only got monitors in 2008. Yeah, I was writing stuff on these little computer speakers and a sub, which, you know, was fun for a bit, but I think if I would say you're going to buy anything, definitely buy monitors because if you can't hear accurately what your stuff is sounding like, then I th I think you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot a bit. I mean, I know there's some massive producers who just use the stuff they've been using for years, but I do think monitors are very important and definitely buy the best you can afford because you kind of get what you pay for with monitors, really. Um, so yeah, I've had the same ones for four years and now I know them really well and I know they tell me the truth about what my music sounds like. So over the years, my, so my setup stayed relatively consistent. I bought a few new bits of hardware and occasionally a better computer and a few... Sometimes it's fun just to have stuff to play around with. If you're always on your mouse sort of clicking things, it can get a bit frustrating. And sometimes to get that new inspiration, you just need something to play around with, something physical to sort of tweak and make sounds with. You know, if, if I'm ever feeling uninspired, if I'm ever... If you're ever sort of hitting your head against the wall being, I can't write any music today. If you just switch on the synthesizer, press record and then jam out for a bit, you always, always end up with some interesting noises and you feel like you've done something, basically, rather than just getting frustrated with not being able to write music. So, yeah, my setup's relatively simple. You know, a track like Work Them is 100% digital, you know, it's, there's nothing outboard in that at all. Whereas, you know, some of my other stuff, a lot of it, comes from external sources. Is that a bedroom made record? Yeah, pretty much. Um, your neighbours must love it. Well, the great thing about living in Leeds and student housing is all your neighbours are students and they don't really care. So yeah, I was very fortunate for a few years to have a space where I could just make as much noise as I wanted. And yeah, I think that's very important as well. Because if you can't hear your music loud, then I think you're missing out on missing out on a big aspect of it. So. Yeah, if you're fortunate enough not to have neighbours or to have nice neighbours or to have a separate studio space, then I think that's very beneficial, yeah. And uh, tell us briefly about building a track. Where does it start for you? And I mean, obviously everyone has their own process, but um, how do you, when you sit down with a blank canvas, how do you start building a tune? I think, I mean, it very much varies tune to tune, obviously. Uh, some tunes you might hear a sample that you really want to use, um, and then you start playing with that and putting stuff on top of it. 
But a lot of the time, you might just, some very rhythm orientated, I might just start a drum beat and see what happens. But things can go very interesting ways, like if you start a tune with a sample and build stuff around it, sometimes I'll just end up taking out that original sample. You know, it can, it can drift very far from what you started with. And some of the best stuff I've made has been sort of happy accidents in a way, like deleting something by accident and you're like, oh, actually, it sounds better like that. So I oh know it's hard to pin it down into a specific formula or a specific manner of working, but yeah, maybe generally starting with drums and rhythm because I find as if a tune doesn't have that certain groove, that certain rhythm, then I never really like it that much. Mm. So can you explain to us why you've got so many different names? <laughs> I'm sure a psychologist would have a, <laughs> have a field day. Um, well, f for stuff like my Maurice Donovan stuff, I might, I'll might play one of those tunes in a bit. Mm. But that's a, a sonic decision that's very much a sort of, this is a separate project. It's sort of a bit of a joke, separate project. Whereas the difference, I work as Ramadan Man, I work as Pearson Sound, I've done a few collaborative projects. But I think we were talking about 2010 and I had all these different releases out. I think part of the reason was I had a few different names, so I could sort of, you know, if people bought a Ramadan Man record one week and then a Pearson Sound record the next, there'll be a lot of people who might not know that two people are the same. And so it can be beneficial in that in terms of not oversaturating, but also with the name like sort of Ramadan Man, it's something I made up when I was like 13. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really stupid name and <laughs> it's, I've been doing stuff as Pearson Sound since about 2008, but it's only in the last couple of years that I've solely focused on that. And it's, I don't know, I see it as a bit more of a serious name, um, a bit less gimmicky, and I think also maybe certain names can get associated with certain sounds and styles of music. I think you see it happen with quite a few producers. They get labelled as, oh, he's a drum bass producer, so I'm not even going to listen to his new stuff. So I think often names can give you a bit more freedom, um, maybe remove preconceptions and I, I just think it's quite fun trying to confuse people and switch things up and yeah I th I'd, I'd like it just to be judged on the music basically um, and for people not to worry too much about who made it how do you deal with the um, sort of Ramadan imitate the Ramadan man imitators and the, and the Pearson sound imitators of which there seem to be a few coming <laughs> up well yeah I was listening to on the way here, I was listening to some of the stuff I've been sent recently, and just sort of, it's quite funny when people send you stuff that really is copying you. I don't know, I'm not sure what the intention behind it is. Maybe, like, oh, it sounds like you, you'll like it. But I mean, I'm not really bothered by it because, you know, I've, I think I did it first in a way. So I'm not, it doesn't really bother me in that respect. But it can be a bit frustrating sometimes. Um, well, you know, if I'm happy with my own stuff and as long as I'm happy with being original, then I don't really let it get to me. And I think, you know, maybe in the long run, people, I'm not sure people who are, I mean, there's there's definitely imitating and being influenced by, and some of my good musical friends who have had you know, big tunes have even said to me like, oh, sorry about that, Dave, that might have been a bit too, <laughs> too close. And I'm just like, I don't really care, man. Like, it's not like I've never been influenced by anyone or... It's not like I can trademark that sort of sound or, you know, put, I can't trademark an 808 or... Yeah, I, I, I don't really try to think about it too much. You know, if, if I like a tune, I'll, I'll play it pretty much. And who are your musical contemporaries at the moment? Who 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 are you looking to that really inspire you? Um, it's a bit tricky, really, because I find whenever you get asked the inevitable, like, who are your influences question, it's kind of... I never really see it in that way. Obviously, I like a lot of different music and a lot of different artists, but as much as I like Madlib or whatever, I'd, I would never say this tune is influenced by Madlib. I think it's more subconscious in a way. You're influenced by everything around you. You're influenced by the environment you make your music in, you know, people you hang around with, the lifestyle you lead. So I find it really hard to pin down. I mean, I could list people who music I like, but if, if we're talking sort of peers and musical peers, I definitely think there's a movement of people who, you know, we get booked for similar nights or play on similar bills or sort of hang out, do radio shows together. And you know, that would be people like Ben, Kev, obviously, you know, and from like Bok Bok to Jack Master to One Man to Floating Points to Joy Orbison, James Blake, Mount Kimby, all that lot. Um, yeah, if we're seeing it as musical peers, we're all kind of a similar age, similar musical backgrounds, but we're all off doing different things and we all sort of respect each other's space in a way, I think. 
mean, it's interesting that you come from such a dub plate culture of cutting tunes early and everything, but there seems to be a paranoia among the, the new school labels about letting tunes off too early and, you know, if they get ripped from radio shows and put on YouTube and everything. I mean, sometimes as a radio DJ, I get sent, you know, a Night Slugs release the week before it comes out, which is not something I've ever been used to <laughs> in terms of getting music early. You know, it's, it's almost like anti-promotion in a way. I, yeah. I, kind, of, I kind of like it. Um, I think too often there's tunes that you know, 20 DJs end up having and they just become overplayed and people become sick of them. And by the time they come out, everyone's like, oh, I'm not even going to buy this. You know, that, that I've been hearing that vocal for the last six months. So I don't, I don't want to hear it. So, for example, with something like Work Them, we took a decision to hold it back. And I, I think it's about keeping music special as well, because if everyone's got a tune, like, what's what's the point? If everyone's playing the same thing, it's... I mean, once it out, once it's out and people can, you know, buy it or play it themselves, then I think it's fair game. But before release, I think it's important to keep things special. And you know, for my own music, I don't really send it out that much. I like to keep. You know, if people come and see me DJ, they want to hear my new music. And if I'm the only one that has certain tunes, then that's cool. Mm. Like that grab somebody thing. I think I'm maybe that one or two people have it, and that keeps it special. And if you want to come and see me play, you know, you'll hear things that no one else will have or stuff that I've just made, which keeps things fresh. Well, there's loads of tunes of yours that I'd love to play on these speakers, but um, I think it's time to open the questions up to the floor before we play some more music. I've got one already. Yeah. Tick, tick. Hello. Hello. Hey, thanks for coming. Um, I spend a lot of time in uh, airplanes and airports as well, and I'm wondering if you uh, uh, do you produce in the airplane? Like, 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 what's your favorite production or whatever, like editing setup in an airplane or in an airport? You know, like in the airplane, you only have a little table. And, well, actually, uh, I never make music anywhere other than my studio or okay. you know my bedroom. I find, well, apart from the fact that I DJ on my laptop, I'm going to carry two laptops, and also. If I was making stuff on the road in headphones, firstly, I don't know my headphones and I'd probably end up just having to do all the work twice. I might make a tune, but then I'd have to re-edit it, rebounce it, change the mix down. And it would just, I don't know, I see traveling as very different space mentally from DJing. I think often when you're traveling, you're tired or annoyed or stressed. And I don't really find it a very conducive atmosphere to making music personally. I know a lot of people love writing stuff on the road and that's the only chance they get, but I'd rather keep the two separate and just, you know, watch some watch some films instead of making music personally. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Hi. Hi. Um, I like the Code 9 tune. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I really want to uh, ask, like, uh, question one: How 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 you name your uh, how you name yourself to music is obviously not dubstep anymore. How do you call it? Um, I mean, we didn't quite get onto talking about dubstep as a name, but for a long time, dubstep people were very interested in the name, and people wanted to be associated with the name. And but when now it seems the opposite. When dubstep comes to mean something else, everyone sort of runs away from it. And I think part of the music that's going on now, it's part of its success, I think, is the fact that it doesn't have a name. You know, if people ask me what I DJ, it's quite a difficult question without reading off some sentence of of genres. And I think it's a good thing, really, not to have a defined name scene, because as soon as it gets a name like dubstep, it sort of means something. It means, you know, a kick on the first beat, a snare on the third beat. And personally, I'm all for avoiding it, and I know sort of maybe journalists and shops especially love to label something in that way but yeah i'd rather just not think about it too much to be honest but i guess it just takes elements from a lot of different music and combines them into something fresh hopefully cool um also um just just my opinion to look at the whole whole world about the music scene now happening uh it's all about come from uk or come from us so uh, but compare those two plays like England music seems change all the time. Like every, every don't know ten years, like big movement, and every couple of years, like the music changing. Like you can tell the big, big, the big different. So I really want to know what do you think, or 
do you think what is behind the music scene that push the whole music scene go forward all the time? I think, I mean, England's always, or the UK has always had this culture of you know, sound systems, of this lineage of music that some people subscribe to this theory of the hardcore continuum where you know, acid house goes into hardcore, goes into jungle, goes into garage, goes into dubstep, you know. I mean, I kind of think it sort of makes sense, but I think you can't stuff start applying music into that theory. So I think there's always been this lineage in the UK of new music, and I think people, there's a hunger for it, and partly because the club scene in the UK is so strong. Uh, there's so many different clubs. Very underground music is still incredibly popular. You know, you can have a very underground artist playing to a thousand people in the UK very easily. You've got clubs like, you know, Fabric playing really underground music to 3,000 people every weekend. So it's definitely more in the culture. So there's there's a bigger audience for it. But in answer to the question why it's always moving forward, um, I think it could be to do with the sound systems as well. Like often the sound systems in the UK are of a good standard. And I think having a sound system which accurately represents frequencies and you know has all the bass like you know if i played the tune i just played earlier on you know tiny little speakers i think it would lose a lot of its impact so i think having spaces where people can hear music how it's meant to be heard um are very important and you know without wanting to generalize a lot of the time in say america that isn't quite the case and a lot of people are frustrated there because they know how good we have it in uk and europe but I think that's part of the reason why music also develops in different ways. Like, for example, the really noisy dubstep, for example, it sounds quite good on phones or like really small speakers. It doesn't quite, it, it's not as essential to have the full frequency range. So, yeah, and to summarize, I think maybe it's to do with better sound systems. But I'm, not, I'm not too sure, really. It's, it's hard to say. Thank you. Over here. Hi, David. Hi, Joe. Um, uh, you, um, you're obviously in a sort of really privileged place that you can go over loads and loads of different styles now, and you're not beholden to the dubstep scene or anything. Um, but you just, you know, your new stuff is doing this very purist house thing. Um, do you ever feel like there's a duty or, or a danger of diluting something that came from a small purist underground scene, you know, a, a very particular sound when you're constantly going between things. I think the whole house thing is very interesting because right now we're at a time where, you know, especially for sort of my peers and sort of this movement, it would be much easier if it had a name, wouldn't it? <laughs> this current musical climate is a lot more house-based than normal. And I think it's a bit dangerous in a way. There's this whole debate about a lot of the stuff that's being made at the moment. Is it merely just rehashed house from, you know, the 90s, just with a sort of slightly more modern touch? It's a bit of the sort of emperor's new clothes syndrome, um, which I sort of definitely agree with. And when I DJ, I'm very conscious of just, as I, as I love house music, you know, I've been DJing it for years when I was a teenager. Um, but I, that's, I don't really feel that's what I'm here to do, in a sense. I'm, I'm not here just to play a house set in a club. Um, so I think there's definitely a danger of just becoming a bit too formulaic in, in that kind of way. Um, and you said earlier about being in a privileged position where you can now play a lot more genres. Definitely a couple of years ago, people who would come to see me play would you know, uh, be expecting a certain sound. And at that time, things were already moving. So when I'd be playing some of the newer stuff or houseier stuff, there'd be a lot of people who get angry. I mean, that still happens recently even, like sometimes in America or had in Australia, someone told me to play some dubstep, you <laughs> insert expletive there. <laughs> so sometimes you do you do get it, but definitely now I feel very fortunate to be in that position where I can play, you know, two hours set and start at house music and end in dubstep and play all sorts in between. And I think that's what I'd really like to do is keep the variety because I'm not sure I could ever really play an hour of just the same kind of music anymore. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm curious about when when you make music, do you are you always making music to be heard in the club, or do you want people to who listen to the same music at home and maybe vibe I think out like that? My my primary 
primary thought when making tunes is definitely how it's going to sound on the sound system. I think that's just the minds that I've always been in since going to forward. Um, it's just all about the club, I think. I mean, obviously stuff like the ambient thing um, or music that I make for different, I don't want to say uses, but different intentions, um, then it becomes different. But the, the club and the dance floor stuff I pl play is always designed for how it will sound on a sound system and that's the opt the optimum environment for it to be heard or at least on a very good, you know, hi-fi with lots of bass. So yeah, I, I always have that in mind when I'm making music. Cool. Do you, do you see your stuff in the future always kind of for the club stuff or do you see yourself maybe kind of well, going in more of like the like the ambient sort of tune? I but just like to keep doing everything really. I think that's what I enjoy is being able to write a big club record but then also just doing some really introspective, you know, three minute drone piece or whatever. I, I, like, I like being able to do that. And um, I think the danger is when you start thinking, oh, does this sound good on a mobile phone? Or, you know, will this sound good on speakers with no bass? That's maybe when you start to compromise how you make music in order. F it, you, sh you shouldn't be compromising for the format it's played on. Like the format should be catering for you, I think, personally. Obviously, that's an ideal world, but I think that's what you've got to aim for. Thanks. Jesse? What's going on, brother? Um, Hello. <laughs> you were speaking earlier about uh, when you gave the um, your physics teacher the, uh, the the CD or whatever it was with your music on it. You said you had an explanation of what you were feeling when you were when you created it, or it was less feeling. I mean, it was kind of just jumbled thoughts of a 15, 16 year old. You know, like for the drum bass tune, I was like, this is a really ravey, a many drum bass tune. Like the vocals a bit stupid, but yeah, it's wicked. I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, I've got it here, but I'm not going to read anything out. Um, it's probably, it's probably but far too cringe. You shouldn't have said that. Yeah, I shouldn't have. <laughs> but yeah, it was. But why? I'm sorry to cut you off. But why do you think? Why do you think you felt you had to do that? Do you? Can you recall? I don't know really. I mean, I gave CDs like that to a couple of other people, and I'd always sort of. I I don't really know. I think it was just. Yeah, it's hard to say, sort of trying to explain myself or trying to, yeah, I, I don't know. It's interesting. It, it was just interesting because then you said you did radio, so I'm pretty sure you did that while you were explaining, describing songs on the radio as well. So, Oh, I did asking. two different kinds. I, I did fake radio shows when I was like 10 or 11, just, you know, me me pretending to be the interviewer and the interviewee and all, all sorts of <laughs> stuff. I don't have those with me, thankfully, um, but stuff like that. But then I also do radio shows currently on, you know, Rinse FM, as well as we used to do it, it on, on another internet station. Um, but, you know, I'd never really introduced my tunes or anything like that. I'd, I think if, if, if I was, say, before I played the ambient tune, if I was like, this is a really sad piece of music, like, you should feel sad. This is <laughs> very sad. And I think that's kind of almost predetermining how people should react to a piece of music, whereas a lot of my favorite music is very ambiguous or even ambivalent. Um, you know, some tunes that people find deeply sad are in, I find incredibly euphoric. And I think the way music's interpreted should never really be dictated. And I think sometimes the way music's presented nowadays, it can almost be telling people how they should react to it when I find the best music's always been. People have very personal interpretations. Hello. Um, was grime important in the development of your sound? Um, I was def I was into grime before I was into dubstep. In fact, uh, people like Dizzy Rascal and Wiley they were very present living in the UK. You know, they were in the charts, they're on top of the pops, they're on the television, on the radio. So it's kind of impossible to ignore it. And I think you know, sort of being middle class kid from North London, you know, you're always seeking sort of like cool, edgy stuff. So obviously, I went and checked out grime. You know, kids were sort of swapping some CDs in my school and stuff like that. So I was definitely into grime. I made a few grime instrumentals. And in fact, the way I the way I even heard about dubstep was I was posting some of these grime instrumentals on the internet and someone was like, no, mate, this isn't grime. This is like dubstep. And I was like, what's dubstep? And then I did a quick Google and another interesting story. <laughs> and that's, how, that's how I got into dubstep, basically, because someone said my tune sounded like dubstep when I'd never even heard of the, heard of the thing, yeah. But I mean, I'm... I still love grime. It's I'm more into the instrumental stuff. I find some grime instrumentals are just incredibly forward thinking and I, like completely out there. I got to work with Danny Weed like a couple years ago. Oh wow. I cool. feel like he's really overlooked in in that UK kind of Yeah, there's he's a definitely like the Dr. Dre of UK <laughs> and no one really knows about it, you know. Yeah, there's loads of 
grime producers maybe even made one or two records who then sort of disappeared off the face of the earth or, you know, completely gave up on music who made some incredible stuff, you know, people like, I don't really know the personal background of people like Musical Mob or, you know, Agent X or, or even Dizzy Rascal's early beats are completely bonkers, basically. Um, <laughs> And yeah, a lot of there's not quite enough recognition. I think maybe there sh maybe there should be a comprehensive sort of Hessel. <laughs> what Hessel Hessel Grime Tape? Actually, there has been there's a site called Grime Tapes, which has sort of collated loads of important pirate radio recordings. Because a lot of these instrumentals, they they were never released. They they only exist as a two minute freestyle on some pirate station, and lucky enough to be recorded maybe. So yeah, if you're interested in that, have a look for Grime Tapes. They've got some really interesting stuff. Well, that too, yeah. I think a lot of that stuff, it, the producers didn't so much care about putting it out. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes in that scene, it can be too much about the money. You know, someone's written a sick beat and they're like, well, you can have it, yeah, but you've got to pay me £4,000. And obviously that's a ridiculous amount of money. So it often got to a loggerhead by the artist being too demanding and not really caring whether it came out or not and just doing it for this money in a way. Hi. Hello. Um, we're talking about music cycles and uh, the hunger maybe for UK scene to uh, find new genres. Do you think... Oh, sorry, say again, mate. Yeah. So we were talking about music cycles and, and the hunger for new music styles. And I don't know if bass music, the term applies or not, but do you think maybe in a couple of years people will tell you, hey, play some bass music and don't play this whatever it is that you're doing at the moment. I, th I think genre names have always been a bit stupid, like drum and bass, it's like, <laughs> like so many other music has drum and bass, uh, or like, I mean, even dubstep's a stupid name because it doesn't have anything to do with dub as in dub reggae, it's dub as in instrumental, so even a name like that's really misunderstood. misunderstood. I quite like the name Brostep, I think that's quite good. <laughs> but in terms of, in terms of genre names, I don't really know. I think bass, stuff like bass music, UK bass, future bass, they've sort of stuck a bit more than other genre terms. And I think, I, I don't mind them so much because they're quite ambiguous. You know, they emphasize the whole bass aspect, which is cool. So yeah, I don't know if something like that became the label, I wouldn't mind too much really. But not talking about the name, but about what do you think it's going to happen? Is it going to th be the same cycle, like people going out of it and then like more noisy stuff? putting on that type of music and then oh, right. more intelligent coming things. <laughs> next. Intelligent. Yeah, I don't know. That's a dangerous word. Um, or dumb things. I don't know. That's a whole different discussion. Um, I think, I mean, you can kind of see it in a different way. For example, with this 808 stuff, you know, it's becoming to a state where there's loads of really, really boring 808 or even some of those sort of when the two-steppy stuff got popular and people started putting chopped up vocals and nice pads over things, that became rinsed and rinsed and rinsed and, you know, to a stage where it just became really boring. So maybe, you know, maybe there won't be loads of wobbles put over it, but it will just get to a very sort of boring stage. I don't really know, to be honest. There'll always be people doing interesting stuff. And I think people, I think it was like Richard Russell who runs XL Recordings, he said recently on Twitter, uh, something like, you know, people are always hungry for new music. Like people might assume that the mainstream is always content with lowest common denominator stuff, but I think innately people have a hunger for new stuff and uh, progression. So I don't think it's anything to worry about particularly. Any more questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, I'd just like to elaborate a little more on the the question of genres in electronic music, because it seems interesting to me uh, that I'm not like in the, I've never lived in the UK or in the US, but uh, it seems interesting to me uh, when I look at the UK, which has so many subgenres of the music that's coming out of there. And when you, I look at a place like LA, for example, which is pretty much the LA beat scene. There's not much else to it in terms of labeling. Do you? Uh, I know you have said you have a problem with certain names like uh, Future Bass and all, and all that stuff, uh, dubstep, drum and bass. But uh, I was wondering if you have a problem with uh, names, specific names, or you have a problem with the, the labeling process itself. You think it it should be more condensed. I don't really have a problem with any of the genre names. You know, they might be. St stupid but it's like a 
I think to a certain extent you need it. You know, if you walked into a record shop and there were no dividers between the records, it was all just like music or like, you know, when record shops have sections called like electronic music, it's like, that's just not helping anyone. So you kind of, you do need these labels, but unfortunately they have a side effect often of defining a genre or uh, coming to represent something which is not necessarily the music. So. In that sense, I have a problem with the labeling process, but I also accept that it's necessary in order just to you know, make life a bit easier, I think, yeah. Everything's all house anyway, basically. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, just because we're on the sort of theme of this idea of progression or cycles or whatever, um, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. Last week, Francisco uh, Lopez was talking about the idea that um, a lot of his records sound kind of they kind of sound they kind of sound the same in a sense, and there's no sort of aesthetic progression sometimes. Um, and what he was saying was, you know, you wouldn't expect in other art forms for people to progress really at all, um, and you know, from one year to the next. And well, like sort of a Picasso painting, uh, sort of always looks like a Picasso painting, or, yeah. or the idea that you would have, maybe, you know, a painter might have kind of periods where it right. takes, it might take them, they might do twenty paintings that are all of a piece. Whereas with music, it's sort of assumed that people want to progress and hear new things. Um, so kind of the, the question, or what I'm kind of wondering is, do you think that there can be something almost kind of harmful in that, that sort of the quest for novelty? Because, you know, the idea that a nice chopped up vocal sample in a pad, it does get rinsed. You're, you know, you're right, but musically, maybe the, the great song hasn't happened yet. Or I'll tell you what, I might play a quick clip of a tune um, which came out on my label, which is kind of... The period in time I was talking about of experimentalism at Forward and places like that, there's this guy called Untold who we released, and he released an EP called um, It's Gonna Work Out Fine, which is kind of this six track EP of just really cr incredibly out there ideas. Uh, this is a tune called Anaconda, which kind of, you know, you drop in a club and people just laugh like it was that sort of. I think there can be a danger with trying to make stuff so new and out there, it just becomes really unlistenable and just very self-indulgent and a bit arsy. But if, it, if it's done correctly, I think you can get stuff like this. Yeah, this is a tune called Anaconda, which came out on Hessel, which is just a bit, yeah. I'm, if it doesn't disappear so far into its own backside, then I think it's it's okay, you know, as long as it retains that, people can still dance that. It might take them a while to pick it up, but I think, I kind of see what you're saying. If people are always feeling they have to progress and then end up just, just being a bit too, it become it doesn't become club music anymore. Basically, it becomes sort of you know installation music or. But I think more what what I mean. It's not the sort of. I think it's good if 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 somebody wants to do something that's that's different. That's got to be a good thing. It's more. It's less about the positive side of it and more about the negative side, which is, um, somebody makes a good tune but people don't want to hear it. You know, it's the it's the negative side. The kind of well, oh, that's, people been, that's, been do that's been done. It's not that I think progression's bad. It's the mindset of the listener, the idea that. Oh, you mean oh, you sort can. of if someone made a massive a massive record, but the fact that it came out a year later than a record which kind of did the same thing, does that mean that record is no longer a massive record? That that or yeah, something something about somebody does something and it's and it's kind of considered oh well that would have been that would have ah. been an amazing tune if it came out a year ago and you're thinking well I mean it is or it isn't like you know you know what I mean and and I think there's definitely yeah. something about the mindset of progression that in other genres you don't get that like how many people who are into funk. <laughs> would say if, yeah. if they made an amazing function, they'd go, well, I mean, it would be good if it came out in the 70s. But <laughs> yeah. That's what, a really whatever. good point, actually. I've never really had, had heard anyone think about it like that. Um, <sighs> how do you know. feel about it? Sorry, because I don't mean to soapbox. I just wonder what you think, what you think about it. Like, um, <laughs> it's really hard to say. I mean, the way I see my own music is like a tune like work then, for example, I could try and make it again or use similar drum sounds and you know I did have a you're talking about painters having periods I kind of saw I, I work in that way you know I, I write a block of tunes and they're kind of in a similar style before sort of progressing and you know doing something different and I, I, I'm a believer in that there's no point trying to remake a tune you've already made so I could make you know 10 work thems but I don't think there'd be you know I think the the one that came first is generally the best one and you'd end up just wasting your time trying to sort of clone something. The way I see it is sort of, you spend ages working on a style and then you release a tune that sort of sums it up and encompasses everything that you've wanted to do in that. And I, some of the tunes I played, you know, that's how I felt about them. And 
Yeah, I'm not really sure what I'm trying to say, but I, that's a really interesting point, actually. I think a lot of it is what came first. You know, why would someone give this record the time of day when someone's done it a lot better a year ago? It's just, it's just people's mindset. I think it's about who came first or who did it first, maybe. Thanks. Over here. Yeah, I got one more question. Um, and I'm from the southeast U.S., you know, that's where I grew up, and uh, we are not really known for our club scene. Whereabouts in the U.S.? Uh, I'm from North Carolina and went to school in Tennessee, okay. so I kind of claim the southeast. So, yeah, not really known for our club scene. You know, we have guys with big beards playing <laughs> instruments and stuff, you know, <laughs> flannel, lots of flannel, and, yeah. Um, so, you know, but, it, yeah, you know, like, you're from, you're from London, you grew up with that. Like, I only started listening to, like, proper, like, dance music or, like, club music in the last couple years, really. Mm. I was just wondering if, uh, you know, yeah, like, kind of tying in with Stuart's question, like, he's talking about all the, all the genres and consistent, persistent, like, uh, you know, change progression or questioning. Are you thinking kind of the time it gets over to the southeast of America, it's already changed? You mean? No, actually, I was I was wondering more about um, the the creative angle. Like, do you know anyone? Are you familiar with anyone who makes music to be played in a club who doesn't listen to club music? If that makes sense, you know what I mean. Like, uh, like I've who doesn't follow the the constant stream of um, <laughs> of that? I think there's a lot of people. Well, I say a lot, a few people who inadvertently make club bangers, you know, without kind of realizing it, a tune gets picked up and ends up being recontacted. I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but there's certainly been records in the last couple of years that have been picked up by like a certain scene when they were made. Uh, I can think of an example, actually. I played like this African house record on Sunday, if you were there at Sirocco, which I heard the other day, and I started playing it, and I doubt. It was designed, you know, it's a South African house record, and I doubt that it would ever be thought that sort of a London, well, sort of future-based dubstep whatever DJ is going to be playing that. I, I definitely find it interesting when music's designed for one thing or one environment and then it ends up being completely recontextualized either by the way it's mixed or the environment it's played in. I find, I find that very interesting, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I just didn't know. You know, like, because for me, like, when I heard something like, James Blake, like I thought that was like pretty different, but I guess he's a uh, well, it's, st it's still quite different, but you know, he's still following those those trends in club music and stuff as well, I guess. Like, I, I, yeah, I was just wondering if there's someone that really well, for James, for example, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for him, but I know he wasn't he had a bit of an epiphany in a similar way to me and lots of people, but he at DMZ, I remember, he even gave me a he came to DMZ back in 2000. And, Nine, it would have been, you know, he came and handed a few CDs, I've got it somewhere. And he was, he had this epiphany with electronic music and he was into it a bit before, but that's when it really started informing what he was making. Um, but I think once you sort of get into that world, it's always, that's, you're always going to start listening to it, I think. It, uh, I can't really think of any examples of people who've got absolutely no interest in club music, but somehow their records get picked up by DJs. So, yeah, I can't really think of it, to be honest. Any suggestions? <laughs> I don't know. Like people who, who are not seen I mean, you know, Shackleton or Berry, they're not people who are sort of... Yeah, I mean, there's definitely outsiders. I think that's a very interesting area that could be looked at. Sort of people who... You know, someone like Berry is some of the most amazing music we've ever written, but he's completely outside of the scene. Yeah. Same with even Duke music. I mean, a lot of Duke music is less about the music, more about the dancing, but the way it's taken in London is no one give, no one cares about the kids dancing. They just care about the music. It's completely flipped on its head in a way and recontextualized. Maybe, I don't know if it's a negative thing, probably, but yeah. Um, <coughs> I just got a thought when I listened to your question and the discussion about it, that I think that in a way, I mean, Club music's been very professionalized and the whole process is very, like all the uh, different uh, things that you need to make it and, you know, get your label out there and charts and there's so, mon so many charts and so many different f forums for kind of uh, reaching out uh, that I think in a way with this progression thing, it might be in a way that um, 
it's about like the myst the mystical thing of a creator of music who innovates and who is like this kind of genius and not so much maybe about the whole um I like the, the music just like listening to music just hanging out with some friends and hearing some tunes and i think definitely it's in the last few years it's become a lot more formalized as in you have a big record you've got a strategy you've got a promotion strategy like oh shall we go for the sort of pretend he was found on myspace and then market it like that or shall we go for the straight in with the like oh he's a really good looking singer let's let's push that angle i think it's definitely become a lot more formalized and streamlined in that way like okay on the week of release let's do this podcast or the you know the the week of release let's give away this mp3 on this website it can be very calculated in that respect so it's incredibly refreshing when you get someone like I've, I've got Levon Vincent on my mind because uh, his latest record just came out. And the way he operates is, obviously he's an incredible producer, but he'll make music and then he'll just say to his distributor, he'll be like, look, I've got a new record and it comes out. There's no press, there's no promotion, there's no hype. It just comes out, people judge it on the music. That's kind of what happened with DMZ. DMZ would never announce their releases. You'd only find it out by, you know, the week before it came out, they'd be like, this is in your shops. And it'll be a complete surprise. And I definitely think that's missing in a lot of today's music, unfortunately. There's element of surprise and just, uh, there's, <laughs> without judging other producers, sometimes there's a lot of producers who sort of maybe give too much information, you know, they sort of have 10 different press shots from every angle, cover every single pore of their face, you know, give every sort of minute detail in an interview about, you know, the street which they grew up in. And I think sometimes it's nice just to hold back a bit and not have that inform people's opinion of you or your music yeah but i was more speaking about the uh, interest in the f in like the the thing with a tune that sounds a bit like one that came out a year before but it's it's it, it might be almost equally good but you won't you don't want to kind of you won't be getting media attention for that one like someone else did it because kind of the media wants the artists to be like these kind of almost superhuman creators and it's not the scene is being watched by media, you know, the whole thing. It's not like just some people make some, like maybe it was back in forward, you know, that it wasn't all about like who made the, I don't know. It, I kind of feel like that sometimes. <laughs> it's, a, I'm not sure. it's a difficult thought maybe. Well, there was maybe some, I'm a I bit, mean, yeah. Going back to our old friend Mala, who I seem to be constantly referencing, but he, he had this tune for a good, it must have been a year, he had this tune on dub plate. There was no label on the dub plate, it was just this dub plate and he'd play it every gig and there was just this complete mystery. No one knew who made it and it took a year and people people just going completely crazy just trying to find out who made it. There were so many rumours, like could it be this guy, this guy, this guy? And he just completely held it down, didn't tell anyone who it was, but it was actually these guys from New Zealand called Truth and he'd, he'd play this record at the end every set and it would completely destroy it. And yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding your point, but are you sort of saying about I'm not, not sure so much? I, I'm not sure if I'm understanding it either. But it's so not so much about, not so much about who made it, but sort of judging the music for itself. Yeah, yeah. I guess that kind of works. <laughs> Any more questions? No. Well, maybe you could um, line up a tune to send us to lunch with. <laughs> something um something to finish it's something to finish on any requests um, i don't know um you said you wanted to play jamie but you could play mm. anything play something hype yeah i don't know one sec just give me a moment but um, thank you very much for the um, um you could play discussion that blue was eyes a very interesting uh maurice donovan debate <laughs>